All right. All right. Well, I forgot to switch the background back. Let's see here. There we go. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the CNC with Dave show. Um, we've got a pretty good crowd over there in the chat already. Let me do a few uh, shout outs here. We've got Stephen Taranto. Thomas Grimm, Landis Stutes, Ron Godot, I think as they say that, Don Puckett's in the house, Dwight Bennett, Jared Seymour, Tim DeLine, Steve from Hardell Media. If you watch it tonight. Hello, Steve. Paul Stewart, Roy Pritchard. Clyde Labani, uh, Dean from uh, wherever he's from, Canada, I think. Uh, Leroy, CNC Woodworks, Leo Steger. Oh, we got a bunch more here. Ed, oops, David Krause. I missed somebody. Ed Newman, uh, Dave Matthews. Uh, not the Dave Matthews, but Dave Matthews. Um, Eric Luschek, I hope. I probably butchered your name, Eric. Sorry. Uh, Ronald Cool, Jerry Cooper, The Wood Bucket. I believe that's Gary Brady, George Tano, Steve Misher. Uh, yeah, Harry Vaughn. Yeah, we got a bunch of folks over here. So welcome, everybody. We are going to be doing, uh, there's Dan, too. Let me not miss him. We're going to be doing a um, kind of a Q&A. You're welcome to put any questions you might have um, in the uh, chat. Um and we're also going to be talking about a few things that are kind of tips for the, the new folks. I know we got a lot of new folks that are building their machine and should be, you know, starting to get them ready to fire up for the first time. So we'll try to uh, share a few tips that will help you when you're getting ready to getting ready to make some chips for the first time. But first, let me remind everybody that we have the, 2019 this is the fourth annual excuse me 2019 gatton cnc christmas challenge uh this is a, a challenge specifically for cnc guys and gals they can um use their cnc to make a christmas themed project shoot a short video send me a link to the video and that's how you enter to uh, to win. We've got uh, got some pretty good sponsors. We've got Klingspore Extravag. Uh, I always want to say Extravaganza every time. Klingspore Woodworking Shop is. Uh, I, I have to go back and look to see what he said they were going to donate as a prize, but it's some kind of little sanding thing um, that's real handy for uh, CNC work. Um, Rockler. Uh, woodworking is going to donate a set of four of the Rockler clamps, I think, hold down clamps. Um, Miter Mike is going to do a couple of $50 gift certificates. And then, of course, yours truly uh, and Gatton CNC will cover all the rest of the stuff. And as of right now, we got a, a awesome entry from uh, Rob Schuster earlier today if i'm not mistaken that makes five entries we normally have uh over you know, over the last three years we've always had around somewhere between 15 and 17 or something like that and you know we only do this once a year so i figured no matter how many entries we have i will make sure that everybody wins something uh so It'd probably be stuff like router bits because um, everybody can use those. Um, maybe uh, maybe a um, 
um, what do you call it? The pendant, maybe another pendant, um, stuff like that. So uh, just keep that in mind. You've got until, let's see, today is Saturday the 14th. So you've got about 10 days or I guess, yeah, yeah, about 10 full days because the deadline is 11.59 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Um to get your uh, your video in so i hope everybody will will think about getting in that challenge and uh shooting a short little video so anyhow let's uh let me switch that banner now uh we'll just put this one on here i guess to remind folks that they can just put their questions in the chat and let's see here Okay, let's see. Let me go back to the comments here. Get caught up. <laughs> I guess we've got a bunch more folks. Rob Hampton from uh, Paul Stewart already has a question. I'll, let me come back to that question here, Paul, in just a sec. Uh, let's see here. Well, okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get into it. So I see... Uh, I was just trying to see if folks here. We got John here, Rob Schuster's here, Mike Haichu, Charles Lawrence, Oakland. Hell, we got a bunch of folks here tonight. So, all right, let me get back to Paul's question. He says, "I was wondering if you have to use two stepper motors on the y-axis, or can you use a belt?" In between, well, if you're talking about one of my machines, either Garage Works or uh, a Gatton, yeah, you need you need to use two stepper motors on the one axis, and they'll be shared together because uh, you're running two lead screws. Uh, that little bitty Go CNC that I used to have behind me, I've since taken it back out of this room. It has. Uh, that kind of setup you're talking about where it has one stepper motor turning a lead screw on one side and then it has a belt running to turn the lead screw on the other side. Um, but I would not, you know, if you machine that little, it works okay. But I wouldn't recommend that for the GAT CNC and that's not the way I designed it. So yeah, you're not going to save much by saving the stepper motor because they're, they're pretty cheap anyway. That answers your question. All right, let's see if we got what we got else here. Um, Harry Vaughn says, has anybody tried Mach 3 USB controller? I'm not sure exactly what you mean. I, I have three of the... Um, USB motion controllers that are a UC100 and they work very well uh, and they work with Mach 3 and they're, they're all plugged into a USB instead of uh, having to have a parallel port on the computer. So let me know Harry if that's if that's what you were wanting to know or if you had any, any further details you want to add there. All right, let's see here. Hey, Dave, I uh, I see what you mean about the uh, drag chain, about uh, these little plastic things on the drag chain. My other my other drag chain has one side pops off like a, and it and the other side's hinged, so it's like a little lock and it's hinged and they don't come off. These these are just like once you take one side off, the other side just pops right off. Yeah. Yeah, and and trust me, later on you'll be missing some of those. Yeah, because they'll, yeah, they'll pop right. off and fall on the floor or something. Then you'll vacuum them up and this this super long screwdriver is great to pry them up though. Yeah, yeah. that's fun. All right. Um, Clyde Lamani says, "I think he means a USB." breakout board 
All right, let's see what was the question again. Well, I use the UCNC 100. That's what I think you use too, Dave, isn't it? Yeah, I have I have three of them. Yeah. Well, he might mean a breakout board, but he's saying USB controller, which what I would assume he means motion controller like a US uh, like a UC 100. Um, all righty. Okay. Well, let's. Um, Keep the questions coming if you if y'all have any, and I'll try not to miss any of them. Jim, are you you're able to see the chat inside the streamyard? Correct, Jim. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, just um, let me know if you see any. Well, there there is another guy just below Eleven Atlantica, and this uh, Dan Lovgren. You got to be careful where you buy your UC one hundred because if you get them from China. <laughs> They're not legit. You got to get them from uh, what is yeah. that? C and C. Where was that? Uh, what you see a timestamp on that, Jim? Eight eleven. Okay, let me see if I can find it here. Okay. Yes, they're the the safest way to know, Dan, if you're buying, and and it's okay to buy them on Amazon. But make sure that the seller is uh, either CNC for the number four PC or CNC drive. Um, then you'll know you're getting a good one. And the other thing is, if it's anything less than a hundred bucks, you know it's a knockoff because they're going to cost about a hundred and nine, hundred and eight, something like that, hundred and ten. They're always right around that price. But if the seller is CNC drive on Amazon. Uh, and if you have any doubt, you can always click on the links that I have, the affiliate links, uh, because they will be the legit ones. There are some folks that have bought some thinking they're getting a really good deal for $49.95 or something like that. And then they find out it doesn't even work right. So you do have to be careful um, about buying those. Uh, Okay, well, I might have just answered that. You can, like I said, you can buy it on Amazon or if you don't want to use a, a Amazon affiliate link or something, you can go straight to the uh, CNC drive or the CNC number four PC. Either one of those places. I can, I'm trying to remember which one is which. The The... One of them, I think it's CNC Drive. They, they should be in Florida. That's where they're located. And those are the, the good ones. Do not buy, as Leroy says, do not buy the knockoff sold on eBay. Like I said, if it's not if it's not 100 bucks, it's not the real deal. Um, it is CNC Drive. CNCdrive.com is is the official. Uh, yeah, that, they're the distributor for all that stuff in Florida. Right. Gerald says, I've seen a lot of UC knockoffs, so maybe he means which ones always go original. Yeah. And Patrick confirms what I just said. Uh, if they cost 100 bucks, if you get it for less, it's a knockoff. Yep. You should always be, you know, suspicious of stuff. Anything we talk about on this show and, and we say it's, you know, this price or that price and you go find it and you thinking you got a great deal, you should, oh, that should be a red flag right there. Um, because there's just, you just can't sell it for half price. It won't, it won't be the same thing. I can assure you. Uh, okay. Ronald Cool says, hey, Dave, three inch by two inch bolts through plate and gantry. Is there enough room for the hex head bolts or do you need more washers so they clear gantry? Uh, you could always add an extra big washer to, to step it out a little bit from the, uh, you know, the cross members. You just need to make sure you got enough room to get a get a um, open end wrench in there in case you need to. Tighten them back up after you've got it all assembled. Um, 
Yeah, Jared says, I did that, bought the $50 version, and it wouldn't install the drivers properly. Customer support from China was a nightmare, and after a month, they just refunded me, bought a real one after that. Yeah, just save yourself a headache, you know. It's, uh... all right, Dan says, I don't see a link. Let me, let me look. I think there's one. Yeah, if you if if you're watching, oh, you're on Facebook. If you go to YouTube and watch this show on YouTube and click the show more button, I have a whole bunch of links of everything I've ever bought for CNC's and there is a UC100 USB to parallel. Um, let's see if I might be able to copy this and put it right in the right in here. And then you can, I don't know if that goes to Facebook or not. It showed up on Facebook, Dave. I Did mean, it? It, showed up, it showed up on YouTube, excuse me. Okay. Well, anyway. Yeah, there should be, let me look too, because there should be a link, I thought. It's probably... Should be on the get you go and to the, the website, davegatton.com, and you go to the where it says Gatton CNC component links, and then scroll down. I think let's see if I've got one. Maybe I don't. No, it doesn't look like I have one there for some reason. I thought I did, and I don't see it up there where the other links are. Yeah, you can find it uh, by watching this on YouTube or going to it after it becomes a video and you'll you'll see it. Or you can go to the CNC Drive website and get it. Uh, um, Don says, Dave, please remind the newbie people to watch the video on dip switches and not to burn up anything. Well, yeah, I mean, if they're if they're using a, you know, their controller, uh, I mean, they need to follow their directions that came with, you know, if they're buying the stepper online kit. They need to, to look at that and understand what the the dip switches mean and all that and get it set up right. Um, let's see. Let's see. Paul Stewart says, the reason I ask about the step promoters is because I wanted to add a fourth axis. I didn't see much about a fourth axis on your site unless I missed it. Can you speak of adding a fourth axis? Um, yeah, I've done two different videos and they, both of them have been quite a while ago. But I show how that when you use it, a four axis, because I mean, you're, you're building a three axis machine. You know, you got X, Y, and Z. But when you're using uh, an A axis or B axis, which is whatever you want to call it, and you're slaving it to the Y, it's re you're really using four ac you're using a four axis control to run the three axis. You just have some slave. Well, I've I've done two different videos. One a really long time ago, and one still a pretty good ways to go about how to add a fourth axis. And, and just use one of those four steppers that you already have. Um, it's, it's kind of a pain in the butt because you have to take one loose, but stepper motors are cheap. It's really easy to buy an extra stepper motor and then make a different machine profile for a rotary axis uh, machine. And then you move your Y axis and get it centered over your, your rotary that you mount on your machine. And then once you have it centered on the center line of that rotary, you're no longer moving your Y axis. So you could, you could use either one, you could use your Y or your A uh, connection and move it to the stepper motor that you have already mounted on your rotary and do it that way. Um, I don't run my rotary much, but that's how I do it. I have a spare motor just because it's 
kind of a pain to have to take the motor off. But all I have to do is move it up there. Once I get it centered, shut shut the controller down, bring it back up, add a different machine profile, and and make make that motor connection go from there, from where it was. I use the A axis, which is what I have slaved, and I take that connection loose and then connect it to my stepper motor that's on my rotary and uh, makes it makes it really easy now you could add a whole fifth driver and and do it that way if you want but uh, you know all that's going to do is save you a little time from swapping connections and stuff because once you once you center up that gantry you know you get your spindle or router or whatever you use and centered over the, the center line of that rotary axis you're not moving that anymore um, so you don't really don't really need those okay hope that answered some questions here let's see keep keep going down a couple dave there's 11 atlantica has a question he there you go okay i received my stepper online order yesterday i have four motors two power supplies i heard you guys mentioning xylotex or something is it something additional i need to get no xylotex is the plug and play kit that I used to recommend because it was super easy for, for new people that didn't know anything about electronics. They just, it was all color coded. It was super easy, but he doesn't sell them anymore. So that's why everybody is having to use either the stepper online or an Arduino or a raspberry Pi or, you know, all this different kind of stuff. They have to come up with their, um, their own kind of controller here so all righty let's see here he says you only have one left at the amazon link they go back fast they fill them up yeah they they fill them up pretty quick as soon as that one's gone they'll be placing their order or their order's already being placed uh well Dan says no problem all that thing does is allow a computer connection without a parallel port it it does allow you know it uses a usb uh rather than the parallel port and it's uh, faster but it, it is higher. faster and a smoother uh pulse too than than using the parallel port runs at 25 a uh, thousand hertz versus the parallel ports way slower well it the the uc 100 runs at 100 yeah and runs at a, yeah. Parallel port runs at 25. um okay david portal or david uh, jones from portal woodworks is here um okay i think we're caught up on the questions yeah like i said if y'all got some got any more questions feel free to put them in there but I want to go over a few things um, that that new people should think about before they uh, before they fire up their machine. And I know I get it when you get your machine all built, it, it gets real exciting because you're about to fire it up and <laughs> run it for the first time, and you know. It's a, it's an exciting time. It really is. I still, whenever I build a machine, even as many as I've built, when you finally get ready to flip the switch and, and fire it up for that first time, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. I, I never get tired of that. But here are some things that uh, I would say are tips uh, that you need to think about before you get crazy and just take off running stuff. One is... You need to understand and know how to set up a machine profile. And that's in your either Mach 3, your UC CNC software. Um, I'm assuming it would work with uh, a lot of the other ones, Mach 4 and, and even Linux and stuff like that. Um, rather than just grab a default thing and start changing a bunch of numbers and stuff, Read the, the manual, especially if it's Mach 3. It's not hard at all to do. And learn how to set up a read, machine. Read the manual. We're do-it-yourselfers. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, they need they need to read some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah. read the manual and learn how to set up a machine profile or go watch somebody's videos. I've, I've made videos. I'm sure several other folks have made videos on how to do it. It's easy to do, but it, it will pay dividends in the long run. Uh, so that's the first thing. A second thing I think you should do before you get real excited, because when you start running stuff, it's real easy to forget this. And I know because I have people all the time talking about it. Know, understand what your XML file is and why it's important to save it and not just save it on that computer, to save it somewhere else. And the same thing with your license file. If you've got UCCNC or, or Mach 3 or Mach 4, whatever, they're not going to be anything but a demo version unless you have that license file. Well, you have to treat that license file like money because that's what it is. If you lose that and have, yeah. you know, you'll have to buy another one. Um, maybe you'll talk them into giving you, you know, a, a copy of it again, but it's not their job to, to keep a copy for you. So understand the importance of your XML file, which is basically after you've set up your machine profile, it will be uh, an XML file. So save that because it'll have all your settings. Otherwise, if you if you don't save that and something happens and you have to reinstall Mach 3 or whatever, you'll have to go back and add all those settings again. But if you have that XML file, all you have to do is plug it in there, start it up, and boom, all your settings are there, all the little tweaks and everything that you've spent time figuring out they're all right there. Uh, but especially that and the license file, that's uh, something you need to make copies of and put on an external hard drive or a thumb drive or someplace safe where you know you'll be able to find it. Um, hey Dave, with regards to that, Peter Pasuelo has an excellent uh, tutorial on how to save out your XML files and how to reinstall them. Yeah. And he's from CNC Nuts. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got uh, I've got both Mach three and UC CNC open on this screen share thing. If anybody needs to see uh, exactly where that stuff is. Um. But yeah, just think just think about stuff like that. Like what you know if. If I come out here to run this thing tomorrow and my computer's dead, what am I going to do? You need you need to think about that because eventually it'll happen. It may not happen for a long time, but eventually it'll happen. And I see people all the time going, man, I've been running this thing for three years. Now my computer crapped out and I'm dead in the water because I don't, I don't have a copy of that. And I'm like, you know, it's so easy to make a copy of something. There's, that should never happen. So... Just a little reminder about that. Okay, another thing that's really important too when you get ready to start off, you know, you're getting ready to, you've written a little test program in VCAR Pro or Aspire or whatever it is, Fusion 360, whatever it might be that you're going to use to generate your code. Make sure that you're using the correct post processor particularly if you're in one of the Vectric products, because you go to click on that and man, there's like a gajillion different post processors. And I would recommend saving just the ones you use into that my post P folder. That way, when you go, there's only the ones you use. And if you only got one machine, there should only be one in there. You don't need to see that huge list of uh, post processors because if it's, if you leave them all in there, it's too easy to actually post something that's a, with the wrong one, and then it might make your machine go wonky, and you'll be scratching <laughs> your head trying to figure out what in the heck's wrong. It ran right yesterday. What's wrong now? It won't run this program, and you know it could be something as simple as you posted it with the wrong post processor. Um. Another thing here, let's see. Okay, and this one's probably 
Well, all of these are important. It's hard for me to put a, a list of, uh, you know, priority of what you should learn. But this one is, is one that I see all the time too. Learn how to save your zero. Doesn't matter whether you've got homing switches or not, but particularly if you don't have homing switches, make sure you know, and I've got video showing this. Peter's got video showing this. There's tons of folks out there that have uh, video showing this, but know how to recover from when your machine stops and you, you need to figure out how to get back to where your zero was on that workpiece. It's really simple. You know, you just, the easiest way is just to make a, registration mark with, you know, use a round bit like a quarter inch end mill or whatever you're using, just make a little hole somewhere out in the skeleton part of the workpiece. Or if it's your whole workpiece is cut to size and you don't make something somewhere on the table, someplace that you can go back to and say, okay, that's my zero zero. And then you write down when you start, not after it's screwed up, but when you start, when you set your zero on the workpiece, whether it's lower left or in the center of the material or wherever, you mark how far X and Y that is off of that registration spot you've got. Really simple, but so many people get excited and forget to do that. And then they're in a four or five hour carve of some kind and something happens, the power flickers or whatever. And they're like, oh, what do I do now? Because if you just try to eyeball it, you may get it close, but you won't get it. You won't get it close enough probably. So really easy to do. Uh, like I said, I've got a video. In fact, I just shared it on Facebook, shared the link to it on Facebook the other day because somebody was asking, you know, how do you do it? And that also works if you're running a long job and you just, you know, say you don't have homing switches and you're running a long job and you're like, man, I'm tired. I want to go to bed. I want to finish this tomorrow. You can stop whenever you want. You know, just make sure you write down the line number where you're at and then make sure you have a registration spot that you can call that zero and then know where your work zero is from that location and you're good to go. You can shut it off, go in, take a nap, come back out the next day. You should be able to go right back to it. So all this stuff I'm talking about is really just simple common sense stuff, but I'm just trying to remind folks because I know how it is when you're new, you for, you're not thinking about that stuff. You're just wanting to make sawdust or router dust or chips or whatever you want to call it. So yeah, enjoy, hey, enjoy the thing. Uh, Enjoy the build. Take your time. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. This is great therapy. These, these things. You could look at it like, oh my God, I got 200, 300 of these little clips to do. Or you got la la la. <laughs> hey. hey, Dave. Uh, two things. Uh, one on post processors, and I've done this. When I first started out, I only had a router post processor. I got a laser, and I, you have a separate post processor for your laser. Now, if you're using the Vectric tools, you got to remember if you're doing a, uh, a router cut profile, if you want to do a laser profile, you have to make sure in Vectric that you check the right post processor for the device you're using. Like if you're using a laser, you have to click on your laser pro processor because if you try to use your router one it won't work and and i'm about to get a rotary so i'll have three different post processes but vetric saves the last post processor use so you got to make sure that you have that connected uh, yeah. correctly well, uh, since we're talking about that i'm going to go ahead and uh, screen share i've got this up over here and i can show folks what I'm talking about in your, this is, this is where you should find your Vectric. Um, it's in my C drive program data, Vectric, VCAR Pro, 
uh, version 10. And then when I click on that, this is where I'm at. And you see we have a post processor folder. And if I click on that, you'll see there's a whole bunch. I mean, there's, I don't even know how many's in there. Well, it says there's, is there 400 something? I don't know. There's, there's just a ton of post processors in there. But if you come back a, a level and go to my post processor, there's only a handful that I use right here. So that's, that's what I said. If, if you set up and you're only going to use the Mach 3 post processor, it would be a good idea to come over here to this folder, grab it and make a copy uh, and then come back up to the, the my post P and put it in here. And then you would only have that one post processor in there. And then when you're using your Vectric B carb and you go to post, that'll be the only one that's there. So you can't accidentally select the, the wrong post processor. So. Okay, let's see. What am I up to here? All right, here's another one that I think is uh, good to know. Um, and again, this might require some watching some videos of somebody that's doing a video on this topic or it's in the manual. And I've done videos. I've done shows and showed how to do it and stuff. But that's learn what MDI means and, and you know, what it stands for and learn how to use it. It's very useful uh, in doing things. For example, if you if you set your, you know, just like I was saying to set, set a registration mark, if you set your material, let's say you put your material on there and you clamp it down or tape it down or however you do it, and you set your zero at the top of the material, and in the center of them and in the center of that material so that's where your x and y is and then you go well wait a minute this is going to be a long car if the power goes off or something happens how am i going to be able to find that because once you carve away that center point you, you don't know where it is you know if you put your little x on there or whatever it's probably going to be gone so then you could jog the machine until you get either off the on the table or if you've got a border around that thing put you a little drill you a little hole so it's a registration mark and then go back well then whichever one you've done if you've set to zero first you can say okay well i move five down and five over so that's going to be my my thing you know i always try to keep it an even number like five or six instead of 6.237 you know because that's hard to remember it's something you make it something easy you can remember um but no matter whether you set that first and come over here or you set your registration mark first and then you go there, as long as you know that distance. And then if you do have to use that, it will be handy to know how to use the MDI command to make it move over there instead of trying to jog it and get it to go back. So the MDI hey, Dave, are easy. Dave, another, well, go I'm ahead. sorry. Uh, if you happen to shut your machine down too and it goes to zero and you're going to cut it, when you exit out of box three, it says, do you want to save this fixture? Fixture. It'll keep, if you're on your zero, X zero, Y zero, when you start up the next time, it'll still be there. Yeah, that's a good point. And while I got this open too, let me show something else. And I did it. We just did a show and talked about this not that long ago. But if you come over here to config and general config and come over here to the far right, lower right corner where it says access DRO properties. If you have the box checked that says optional offset save, that will prompt you, like Jim said, and it will you can, it'll ask you if you want to uh, save that. And then if you have the persistent offsets and persistent DRO set, it will do it automatically. So if you do shut down, you can start up the next day, hit, you know, go to zero, 
And of course, this is assuming you have homing switches, which I do. But if you, you home it out and then hit go to zero and it automatically is going to use that G54 uh, offset, which takes you right back to where you started yesterday and the day before and the day before that and all that. So really, uh, really a good, good little thing to use there. All righty. Um, I think I've got one more thing here. Oh, I should have stayed screen sharing too. Another thing that's good to do too, and this is for you guys that have set up a, a touch plate of some kind, whether it's one of the fancy ones, or maybe you got something like me where I just got this old scrap piece of aluminum. Uh, when you go to zero your machine, it's always a good idea to come over here to the diagnostic page. And when you hook your, uh, you know, you stick your angle or whatever it is, your touch plate, whatever you're using below the bit, and what, regardless of whether you put an alligator clip on your bit or not, you know, if, if it's not internally grounded, you're going to need that alligator clip touching the bit or touching something. Always come over here to this diagnostic page and then take the angle or whatever it is is your plate and touch that bit. And you should see right where my arrow is here, this digitized LED, that should come on. That's basically testing to make sure that's working because if you're moving that thing around the, your touch plate and you get a wire that's got loose and it's not working and you don't test it first, guess what happens? When you tell it to auto tool zero, it's going to come down and when it touches, it's not going to stop. It's going to keep trying to go down and it's going to end up messing something up, especially if you're not right there and notice it right away. So it's a good, and again, these are tips for new folks. The guys that have been doing this a while know this stuff, but just come over here to the diagnostic page, touch your, or even before you even connect it, take, take your alligator clip and touch it to your plate and make sure that it's functioning correctly before you connect it up. It turns green. It flashes green each time you touch yeah, it. Yeah, that little square is like a green LED sort of. It, it will show up green. Well, I, I, always, I always connect mine because on my spindle, I have that bolt that's up on the um, the mount part, and I always clip my alligator clip to that. And then I always just take my piece of angle, which has that other wire to it, and I just come over here to diagnostic, and then I just take the angle and touch the bit and make sure that that's lighting up. And if it's not lighting up, I go, wait a minute, where's my, I got a wire loose or something. So... It just saves you from, you know, jacking something up because that thing's coming down. And I, I have mine coming down pretty slow. It's only like four inches a minute. But, you know, if it's if it keeps coming down, you're not paying attention. It's, it's going to try to push a hole through that piece of angle. And uh, it's not going to make for a good day. So, Well, I, I did that one time when I was doing it. I had a porter cable and it's not grounded through. So he had to put the clip on something that grounded it through the router. And usually you put it on the bit. Well, I forgot to take the clip off and started the router. And guess what happened? Eight feet of wire wound up around that thing so fast <laughs> and it pulled it right out of the mother or the breakout board. So I learned that lesson. But when I have a, I bought a Hitachi and they're, connected through so you don't need the ground wire attached to the uh, uh, to the bit so that saved me more than once um, yeah all right that's uh, that was all of the um, and also in case um, I, I made a little banner up here in case anybody has any questions about what post processor they should use for their GAT and CNC, there's probably several of them you can use, but this is the one that uh, I recommend most everybody use because it, it just produces pretty much generic type G code and it works well with the GAT and CNC. There's doesn't have to be anything fancy. 
and it has the line numbers and all that in it. So it uh, makes it easy if it stops or you need to restart, you know how to go to such and such line numbers. So um, that's it. Uh, also, another thing, too, and I think Jim was going to speak on this a little bit, too, is. And again, uh, all you guys that are, you know, been doing this a while. Remember that what I'm talking about here is for new guys. Uh, because I know we got so many of them uh, here lately. Uh, but another thing you need to learn about is the safe C setting in Mach 3 or UC or whatever software you're using. You should have some kind of a safe C setting. Uh, and you won't have that set because if it's set at zero and you need to hit go to zero or return to zero or something like that. And it's already down low. Guess what? It's not going to raise up if it's set at zero. So it will uh, skim the cross your material or depending on where it's at, it may, uh, may cut through a clamp or something like that. So learn, learn what your safe Z is, how to work it and, uh, and set it up correctly. So, all right, let's see if we've got, uh, Jim, did you want to talk about safe C any or? I'm, oh, he must be muted. Are you muted? Uh, he might have lost his mic. Yeah, we can't hear you, Jim. Oh, okay. I turned my mic off. Glenn Helwig at 845. He says, Dave, is there a set of steps for new people like a checklist? I developed my own. By the mistakes I made. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have. I mean, I've never typed one up, but it's it's just something that I think everybody, when they start out, it's it's not a bad idea to make a checklist. It just depends yeah. on how good you are at remembering stuff. I'm old and I'm forgetful, so yeah. And uh, and the thing the thing about checklists, from what I see, is I I, I I've thought about a video or typing one up. And then I realized different people do different things in a different process, in a different order. And the only way to properly learn is to make the mistake yourself. And I mean, we're all here to, to, to back you up when you're, when you're, you know, if you, if you make a mistake, we'll be happy to tell you to suggest what you did wrong. But uh, the problem about a checklist, if, if I tell you, one, two, three, four, five. You may not do one, two, and three in that order. You may start with five, and you'll forget about one, two, and three. So it's too much to remember. Like, like Dave said, I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, that young either, and I wouldn't remember a whole list. Yeah, and, and after a while, I tell you, if you do make yourself a list on paper, you know, tape it to the your side of your machine or whatever. You won't look at it, but a few times because yeah. after you after you've done this a while, yeah. it's going to be second nature. Yeah, and there's there's a few things. It depends on the person too. One person might be the list might be uh, don't forget to change a bit from one tool path to another because that's what they always mistake it. Or another one is don't forget to zero everything out in the beginning. Some people that comes naturally to them, and some people. Uh, one or, you know, different people will make different mistakes. And uh, most people, I mean, if they're like me, I'll make a list of the three or four important things that I always mess up in. And then, and that's it. And the rest of the stuff, you know, you learn on your own. Well, one of the things that I learned right away too is the first thing I, I, I number my tool pass, like, the first tool pass, second tool pass. So there's a number in there so that you can go down and easily find it. Because if you give it some ubiquitous ubiquitous name, it yeah. might not work for you. So I always put one, two, that's, three that's, in front. That's and a then, very good habit, Jim. That's a very good habit to get into. So when you load the G code, it says load G code, number one. Okay, I load it in there. And I look at my job summary sheet that you can create in Vetric, and it'll tell you what the tool is and all that kind of stuff so that you're putting in the right tool. Then when that tool path runs, you got to be sure, you got to be sure that you 
close the G code and load your next tool path in because if you cut, say you're cutting out a roughing path and your next is a finishing path or a profile or whatever, you might rerun that first tool path. And it might not cause any problems, but it might. Yeah, that's a very good point. And that's a very good habit to get into, which uh, that one is one that I learned the hard way. Because even with my years in, in high school and, and college of teachers telling me, make sure you comment your coding, you know, in, in computers. It's, it's the same thing. Name your variables. Name your G code, your tool paths. Because if you have profile one, profile two, profile three, and you've got this huge job and you have to go back to something. I mean, oh, which one was this? Which one was this? It's not only is it is it beneficial and saves mistakes, it's one heck of a time saver. Yeah, Mike Swift has got a questionnaire. He says, where can I find an index of all the G codes? Mike, if you look where my mouse is, there's two buttons on Mach 3 it says G codes and M codes. So if you're using Mach 3, there's all the G codes and it even has an explanation of what each one is. And there's also one for M codes over here as well. And I believe that in, if I can get all this stuff out of here, somewhere in here, and this is UC CNC. Uh, let's see. I'll have to find it because I don't know. I know it's in here, but I'm not sure because I don't use this software as much as I do the other, but I know it's in here somewhere. Uh, let's see. Wikipedia has a good uh, list of G codes too. Yeah. So, so you can go directly to that because G code is very, uh, universal. Yeah. G code CNC list and Google it and, and uh, it's everywhere. Well, I'm having trouble finding. It. I know it's in it's in here. Oh, maybe it's here. Uh, Try help, Dave. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, supported G codes, supported M codes. I don't know why I didn't look there first, but yeah. So yeah, you can always Google it and find it, but if you're using a particular kind of software like Mach 3 or UC100, it will have the ones that they use. So it's better just to look right in your software, unless of course you're using something where it doesn't have this. But um, all righty, so that's, all right, Paul, we get this question all the time, and there are no typical feeds and speeds. For <laughs> it depends on the machine. It depends on the router bit. It depends on, it depends on a bunch of things. So the best thing to do is start conservative, and I've said this, you know, a million times if I've said it once. Start conservative with your... Feed, you know, if it's a, for example, if it's a quarter inch end mill, use no more than half of that diameter. So go no more than one eighth down to be safe. Go a sixteenth down or, you know, somewhere in between there. Start out at 30, 40, 50 inches a minute or whatever. If it seems like you could go faster and in Mach 3, uh, let me get back over here to where Mach 3 was. Uh, with Mach 3 and a lot of other things, you can hit this feed rate right here and you can speed this up on the fly. So you speed that up and when you hear it starting to chatter, back it back down a little bit because every time I hit the, if I start this program, you can see it's running at uh 70 inches so every time i hit it there's 77 84 so you can sit here and speed this up and then when you hear the chatter you can go whoop that's too fast and you can slow it back down and do it that way and also if you 
don't hear any chatter, you go, well, maybe I could go a little deeper. It's all, you have to experiment. I mean, there are charts where they try to show people, uh, but usually the companies that make these feeds and speed charts, they're for their machines, whatever they're selling. There's not a typical feed and speed. There, there is no such thing. So, um, you know, and you'd ask about plywood. What I use for plywood may be totally different than what somebody else uses for plywood. Um, that's just that's just fact of life. That's how it works. Um, yeah, you got right. ca you got cabinet grade. You have uh, Lowe's cheap grade. So three ply. So if you're using like an eight ply or nine ply, it's going to be different than a three ply. So mm -hmm. it's Measure it. You got to check. Hey, uh, there's another one here. Mach 3 is not, it is free for 500 lines, but if you want to do more <laughs> than 300 lines, you got to buy it. It's $175 or something like that. Nothing's yeah, 500 free. 500 lines isn't anything when you're talking about CNC. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, let's see. Let's see. Uh, we got uh, Mark Lindsay CNC in the house. How you doing, Mark? Marco. Um, Okay, I'm looking for questions. I don't see any more questions there. Let's see. Well, we've been on here almost an hour, so it's gone back pretty quick. Um, all right, so yeah, everybody. Yeah, Mach 3 is right around $175. Mach 4 is. is 200 bucks, I think. Um, uh, Allard just joined us. So he's late to the party. Uh, what routers do you recommend? I, you know, there's, there, there's a ton of good ones. I mean, I've always used Porter cable routers. I'm a big fan of those. I've I probably have four or five of the Porter cable 690s, which is, a cheap router. And if you're getting started off um, new, you know, that's why I designed the Gatton with uh, a, where it would hold a three and a half inch uh, routers because there's a lot of them that are that size and a Porter cable 690 is one of them. And the great thing about using one of those is if you're in the middle of a job and it quits, you can run down to your hardware store or Lowe's or Home Depot or Menards or yes. whatever you got, and you probably be able to find one. That's really, what I got in this thing. You know, so uh, it's not, uh, you know, they're they're pretty good to use. The one disadvantage is there's not a speed control on a 690. You can use an 890 series, like an 892 or something, and they have um, speed control. So you can variable speed. So that might help a little, but yeah, any any kind of route. There's a ton of good ones. I can't really recommend one over the other. Ryan makes a good point here. He says the Atachi uh, is a great one. It's very quiet. Yeah, they they are a lot quieter than than some of the other ones. Well, I did a I did a speed and sound test on the Hitachi versus the Porter cable. When you get up into the high uh, speeds, it's not the speed that's doing; it's just the hertz that kills you. And it, they're about the same. When they're at the low end, yeah, it's quiet. But when you're cutting and you have to jack up that speed, they ain't quiet. Because I got one. Yeah. And as Davis said many times, as soon as that router bit hits the table, all bets are off with all the routers. Yeah. Yeah, they're, all quiet. they're all pretty quiet when they're not cutting anything. Yeah. Uh, if you're cutting before 10,000 RPM and cutting real slow, yeah, it might be quiet. But if you have to go up to 12 to 18 to 20,000, 
it doesn't matter if it's a Hitachi or a <laughs> Porter cable or anything. It's it's yeah. loud. Better have some earmuffs. Chris says, Dave, what do you use to create your G code? I use the Vectric products. Uh, VCar Pro is what I've been using for. Well, I've been using it since it was version 4.6. Uh, so I've been using it for, I don't know, about 12, 12 years, 13 years, something like that. Um, I'm a big fan of clamps only because they're cheap. They're, they're basically free because I make mine out of scrap material from other projects. I'm surprised the whole uh, the the tie down method question hasn't hasn't come up. That's always a big one with newbies. Well, here's yeah. another one too, Dave. That uh, they say use a Harbor Freight uh, router speed control. Do not do that on a new router, especially one that has speed control. You will burn it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is not made for the modern routers. If you have a single speed. And I can't remember, I think, brushes. It has to have brushes. But if it's a speed control, do not yeah. use that. You'll yeah, the fry The routers are very efficient with switching, with, with using the power supply digitally. And when you put a, uh, when you put basically those things are, are rheostats. They're, they're basically big resistors. When you do that, you're really killing the electronics of, of, of all the new stuff. The old one, it's just a motor. It's perfect. But... But like you said, not the variable speed and not the new ones. You'll burn them. Okay. Well, we've been on here just over an hour. I don't see any new questions. Let me scroll back just for a sec to see if we may have missed any. Uh Uh, let's see, Steve's got one here. He says, with the Gatton plans I receive, what will my working area be with and length without altering the plans? Will the width handle a 48-inch wide sheet of plywood? The, the plans, as they, if you make it exactly to the plans, it calls for using a half sheet of plywood or a 48 by 48 for the tabletop. Well, when you put your angle, you know, three quarter angle on each side, you're going to lose an inch and a half there. So you're going to have a cutting area of about 45, 46 by about 34, because you're going to lose roughly 14 inches um, on the Y. So you're going to have about a 45 to 46 by 34 if you build it exactly to the plans the plans have them how how wide but also keep in mind that if you with the 48 wide and then you put your angle on there there's an inch and a half you lose you're not really yeah. going to have any room to clamp on the sides if you tried to squeeze you know if you try to throw a piece 46 inches on there you're only going to be able to clamp it in the front and the back if you got you know and again you're only going to have to have it less than 34. But, well, I uh, built mine to the specs. I didn't alter anything, Dave. And when I cut mine, if you roll your um, chassis across to the end, you don't go all the way to the 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 bearing. It'll drop off the end of the gantry. So you got to be careful. You just got to watch that. And you can mark. You should mark where your left and right is if you're not using limit switches. And you should also mark how far back before your gantry hits the back end of your uh, CNC. Because if you're using the 425 ounce uh, stepper motors, it'll pull that screw right off the motor. Trust me, I did it. And I only went over a quarter of an inch and it pulled them right off. <laughs> so I got a big black mark on my bed. Do not go past this. Yeah, that's that's another good tip for uh, for newbies. I think is to jog your machine very slowly and see where it's just about to 
hit a hard stop where you can't go any further. Don't go all the way. Just right, you know, leave yourself at three eighths of an inch or something like that. And then put a line in there or use your router to, to jog a line right there and do the same thing going back. And if you do that, when you're putting your material on, you can have a physical reference or I mean a, a, a site reference where you can look and go up. That piece is hanging past that. So I know I can't go there. So it's real easy to do and, and probably a good idea for, for new people to do that. Um, one, again, this is stuff that, you know, and it, I hate to say this, but you probably are, you know, I, I keep saying newbies. You're not going to be a newbie for very long because it doesn't take long to learn this stuff. When you make a few mistakes, you learn them pretty quick. And you, oh, yeah. you know, oh well, I know I can't go that far, so let me put a mark there. So um, it's really easy to do. And, you know, you learn stuff really quick. Unfortunately, the way you usually learn quick is by making a mistake. <laughs> but that's why we do these shows to try to share some of these tips so that you can not make those mistakes that we've all made before. So, all righty, let's see. I don't see any other. I got one more thing. I see, uh, I see, oh, um, Where'd he go? Where'd he go? I see my buddy Rob Schuster right here. Now, in case you haven't seen, I posted on Facebook and shared it around. Rob was the latest entry to um, the, the 2019 Gatton CNC Christmas Challenge. And if you don't, if you haven't seen it, I'll just kind of give you a quick rundown on what he made. But Rob used his fancy spancy uh drum making machine i don't know what he called it. what's he called it? the rotary machine i guess is what he calls it to make a really cool rolling pin and he makes or he used it to make some cookies uh and he showed them in uh, at the end of the video and stuff but i just like to say and if i can if i can uh do this here for just a second. I want to show you all. I'm not sure if this is supposed to be a bribe for the challenge or what exactly. But, but I got this, this little package here in the mail today. And it's from Rob Schuster. And if I'm going to try to hold this where you can see it. <laughs> He's got made these cookies that say Gatton CNC on them. And he sent me that, like I said, he sent me there's like four or five of these in this bag. I haven't tried one yet, Rob, but I don't know. He might, uh, he might just have an edge on the rest of y'all. Well, wait a second. Wait a second, Dave. Just technically, well, um, uh, Dave, uh, technically, if the cookies are good, he's got one heck of an edge. If the cookies are bad, that could be a detriment. I'm just hoping there's no uh, no router so, dust in it. So on. it's not a bribe. It's not a bribe because it completely <laughs> depends on the. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just hoping there's not any uh, router dust or anything in those cookies. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that was funny because when this came in the mail today, I'm like, yeah, that's uh, that could almost be that's that's like uh, what do you call it quid pro quo or something right there, and. <laughs> <laughs> so just kidding rob just kidding He's, that's a fantastic uh project he made by the way uh probably one of the most unique videos i've seen for the challenge in in my four years of doing it so uh, yeah i thought that was funny uh clyde is saying is the font right now it's not the correct font but it's uh but it does say get and see and see on it. So thank you, Rob, for the cookies. I will enjoy them for sure. Uh, oh, wait a minute. He says they all have different print. Well, I only looked at the one on top. Hold on. <laughs> you got to bite one, Dave. Let's see here. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, let's see if I can hold this one up. This one says. 
Dave Gatton guitars on it. So let me uh, hold on. Here. Let me get this big. Oh, that's, that's cool. Let's see what this one says. Yeah. Oh, they, yeah, they all are different. I'm sorry, Rob. I didn't even. That one says CNC with Dave. It's got the, uh, that looks like the stencil font. Yeah, here's another one that says CNC with Dave. Nice. Okay. And then this one finally says, all right, yeah, he's giving equal time to the garage works. So, all right, cool. I didn't even notice. I just looked at the top one that, that was on top here and saw the, um, that first font. I didn't know they were all different. <laughs> and actually, you know what? I take that back. The more I look at that, that is. That's Batman Forever alternate. That is Batman Forever alternate. Yep. 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 Very cool. All righty. Well, I guess that's going to wrap it up for tonight, folks. Yeah. At 11 Atlantica says, how, and I'm thinking the same thing. How have you not eaten those already? <laughs> well, oh. it's been a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a challenge. Uh, okay, let's one last scan through here and see if we've got any uh, other stuff. I don't see any other questions. I hope we didn't miss any questions tonight. I always try to get everybody's uh, everybody's question in. All right, so. All right, for you new guys and gals, uh, I hope uh, <laughs> I hope you were uh, had a notepad and were jotting down some of these things. Because I can tell you, uh, I share these tips to help save you from some of the uh, silly mistakes that uh, that we made. Uh, and that you know, and it's not that you know. When I call everybody newbies, it's not that I'm any smarter than anybody else. It's just that I've been doing this a long time, so I've already made I already made all these mistakes. I'm just trying to share them with you so you guys don't. So I just want to want you to enjoy your machines and get out there and have fun and and uh, not make any uh, any pretty firewood, which is what I've done a lot of times. So. All right, uh, we are going to, let me get back off of this thing here. Hold on here, get my guys back in here. Hey, Dave, you want to save that uh, Safe Z thing till next week? Yeah, we can go. Yeah, let's go over that in more detail uh, okay. tomorrow. We've kind of touched on it um, tonight, but we'll uh, we'll show folks how to, how to set that up and, and use that for sure. Uh, as well as I might come up with some other examples, uh, little video examples on some of this other stuff, uh, like the touch plate thing and all that. All, although I think everybody sees what I'm talking about. All right. Anyway, we've had a good crowd in here tonight. Thank you all so much for watching. If you um, enjoyed watching this, feel free to give me a thumbs up on your way out. And, uh, and be sure and follow me on Facebook, too, if you're not, because that's where you can uh, learn a lot of stuff about when I'm live and all that. So, all right, we're going to get out of here. Let me see if I can find that magic button. Yeah. And Javi, wave bye now. Have a good one, man. All right, everybody have, have a good one. And we will see you all next time.